we're starting 2.2 now, um, where we're going to be talking about abstract data types. Now, abstract data types um, are a fundamental concept, sorry, um, all worked up, uh, are a fundamental concept when it comes to like ro ro writing robust software, not robusting write software, um, and being able to work with other people. Now, some of you have been exposed to uh, this notion of an abstract data type, whether you realize it or not. Um, I know there's a handful of 1531 students in this course, so sometimes we use the word interface to describe a uh, ADT or an abstract data type. And today we're going to be talking about what in the hell is an ADT, how do you use it, and then how do you like implement one. Um, and this is a pretty critical concept for, um, uh, you know, 2521 in your life beyond. Um, if you've covered this in 1511, that's great. I, I talked to Tom the other day who said that they don't teach them at all anymore. So um, I don't know and I don't really care to be honest because we're kind of teaching you from scratch anyway. I was just saying that, you know, this isn't a crazy new concept if you feel like you've seen this before. Um, ADTs. So what is data type? That's a great question, isn't it? Now, I know you all have the PDF slides probably, but um, I love to ask people this. Um, where it's like, what is a data type? And someone's like, is it an int? I guess, like how would you define a data type? Um, and the easiest way to think about a data type on a computer is that it's a set of values and a collection of operations. And this actually makes a lot of sense because like you say, oh, I thought it was an integer or something, right? But it's like, well, an integer is a, a set of values. I mean, we know this from math. That's all the, the whole numbers from negative infinity, I guess, to positive infinity. Um, and there's a collection of operations you can do on them too. You can add them, you can subtract them, you can multiply them, you can divide them, like you can do all these different things on it. So that's all the data type is. It's a set of values and it's a collection of operations that you can do on those values, right? Um, so you know, your ints, doubles, um, if you've done other types of languages, you have classes and all these other things, but that's all it really is. Um, and I've got some here. So like. For instance, the other one is like an array. An array is a data type. It has a set of values, which is a list or a repeat of any data type. So an integer array is a data type, has a whole bunch of integers. And what are the operations you can do on an array? Well, you can't add two arrays together. You can't multiply two arrays. I mean, you might be able to, but like, say at C, you can't just multiply two arrays together. Um, but you can look up an element, you can assign an element to a specific index, so there are things you can do. So these are data types, set of values and a collection of operations. All we're really talking about today is expanding that notion and tying a bit of uh, abstraction into it. And, and you, you definitely are familiar with the notion of abstraction from previous courses, which is essentially just hiding the details of how a system is built. Um, and our, our focus is then on like, what is the behavior of this type, um, how do the inputs and outputs work, and just like keep it at a very high level behavioristic approach. And, and you kind of already do this in a way, like we say that, you know, an int is a data type, but in a, in a sense it is also an abstraction or an abstract data type because you don't know how an int works. I mean, you, you, a bunch of you probably do, but like in theory, you don't need to know that, right? Like, you know, an int is a number between zero and two million or two billion, I think. Um, and you can plus minus do all this stuff with it. But for a computer, an integer is probably something different, right? Like for some computers, integers, like when you add two integers together, that's a whole series of operations. Or, you know, when you multiply them, that's even more series. Or maybe a divide is simply multiplying it by a a fraction, like etc., right? So you, you're even an integer itself is hiding away all these details of how the actual computer works. And if you've done this kind of stuff in one five two one, or you've you're doing it now, you kind of know what we mean, right? Like C C data types and C operations are an abstraction in themselves, um, and computers are just abstractions built on abstractions. So we know that C abstracts away like your 1521 style code. We know that Python abstracts away pointer arithmetic and memory allocation. So if you've done Python, you know that like you don't have to deal with pointers and freeze and malloc's and stuff. And we know that web browsers, which is just another random one, abstract away the underlying hardware. Like it doesn't matter whether you're using like a Mac or a Windows or a Linux machine or your phone, you can go to the same websites and watch YouTube all the same. So Everything is an abstraction. It's trying to hide details of how a system is built 
in favor of focusing on behavior, inputs and outputs, right? Like just your interactions with it. Um, and these are everywhere, right? You drive a car. How does a car work? You have a steering wheel, you have some pedals, you have a brake, you have a door. That's a car. You turn it on, you turn it off. But you're hiding away the details of how it's built and how it... I don't like using the phrase how it works because sometimes like... Um, Sometimes how it works can be mixed up with behavior. Like you need to know how a car works. You turn the steering wheel and the, the car turns. So the definition of like how it works is a bit vague. That's kind of why it's like, I like saying like how it's built um, because you kind of need to know how it works. You just don't need to know how it's built. So an abstract data type is essentially this exact thing. Um, it's a data type that focuses on the high level behavior without regard for how it's implemented, without regard for how it's built. Um, most things are kind of abstract data types in a way. Um, though what we're really talking about in these lectures is like building your own abstract data types and understanding how to work with abstract data types that other people um, work with. And the key things about an abstract data type is there's a separation of the interface from the implementation. So again, if you think about a car, there's a separation of like, you have your interfaces, what you generally touch and feel and do from like how the actual mechanics of the car work and like how it's actually built etc um, and the idea is you as a user or like a driver of that vehicle interact with someone who's built the car and these interfaces again like steering wheel pedals are this kind of glue that helps someone like you who doesn't really understand how it's built but understand how to interact with it connect with someone who's built it right so it's kind of like this magic magic wall in between um, and we sometimes refer to that as like an interface um, and, and in the world of software engineering, it becomes really important as well because uh, typically when two parties try and do something, you have to kind of agree on what that interface is going to be at the start. You know, so in the case of software, um, you know, you look toward you look toward the uh, the abstractions that an integer provides, the computer provides you, and the people implementing the computer look towards the abstractions they have to provide, and you're both working on this layer that says two integers can be summed together, two integers can be multiplied together, an array can't be multiplied together, right? These are rules that essentially govern those two sides of a user from a builder. Um, and this kind of gets into the, this kind of gets into a little more detail, but essentially we'll, we'll try and keep coming back to this. This is a little bit like a, um, more of a note, which is that uh, when we're actually programming and defining our interface, quite often we talk about these notions of preconditions and postconditions, which are really just the rules that govern how an interface works. So, you know, um, here's an example. When you multiply, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a, the square root, right? The square root operation on a computer. There's a rule that says you can't square root a negative number. There's a rule that says you can't, you know, 10 of 90, all these things. And these are all kind of like, preconditions that are like, you know, what conditions kind of have to hold at the start. I mean, this is a very broad topic that I could give a bunch of different examples, but, um, and we'll keep kind of writing these into our code, but generally speaking, you should always be asking yourself when you're trying to define our interfaces, what kind of things are true at the start or what things do you expect to be true at the start and what kind of things are true at the end, you know? Um, Autumnal says, so a precondition of a stack is that only the top item is accessible. Um, a precondition of, uh, you know, a stack pop might be that there are elements in the stack, maybe. Um, I think, I think, I think, um, you know, I, I think the understanding of what a pre and post condition is varies a little bit in terms of some people might say it's the conditions that hold true for the system. Um, some people might say it's the conditions that the system expects to be held true by you. I'm sure there's like a, a more formal way we could go through it, but my priority in this course is to kind of simply, uh, you know, help you understand that when you're defining interfaces, it's often important to think about, okay, before we begin this operation, what things ha kind of do exist or have to exist, and then at the end of this operation, what kind of things have to exist, etc. Um, and as Kai says, it's covered more in like 2511. Um, we're just kind of throwing a stone at it now. Um, we're going to be talking about what the interface is. Like, this is all very abstract stuff, no pun intended, and we're basically going to spend the next hour coding, um, which will hopefully make it a little bit more real. Um, this is kind of what we're going to be doing. 
So generally speaking, um, when we talk about abstract data types, our actual ADTs, our interfaces will be defined in a .h file, and then there's going to be two C files. One C file has the implementation, how the system's built, and the other file is the user. It's like the person actually using the ADT. And we're going to be looking at um, sets as a basic behavior. So that's what we're going to do. Let's take a five-ish minute break now, and then we're pretty much just going to spend the rest of the day writing set implementations. And we'll see how long this takes. Hopefully we can bash this out in an hour. But yeah, we'll see how we go. So five-minute break. Thank you.
Hi everyone. Um, someone was saying that they, they, what are they, over the break that I play piano? No, sadly, um, I don't do that uh, over the break. Quite often I'm spending my time actually doing other work, which is very painful. Um, and t today, today, like, sometimes the worst things that happen are other work things, startup stuff, um, and like today there was a particularly bad issue that I just had to deal with that. Uh, just, uh, uh, so more back to fun stuff though, um, which is sets. Um, so we kind of get what sets are, right? Um, they're a collection of unique integer values. So a set's kind of like a list except that it's not ordered and you can't have duplicates generally. So um, you have some sets here, even and odd numbers, even on the left, odd on the right, um, and yeah, that's it. Um, but what we're interested in figuring out today, right, there's two kinds of questions we could ask ourselves, which are either firstly, what behavior would a set data type have? Or we could ask, how would we code for it, right? Like. How are we actually going to build it? And the how are we going to build it part is something that we worry about after. And right now, we're focusing more on um, what kind of behavior does this ADT have, right? So we're, we're referring to the set as an abstract data type, right? We're calling it an ADT. Um, and <clears throat> let's brainstorm what kind of operations this set should have. So if you were creating a data type that was a set, what operations would you give it? I'll give you the first one. We're going to create a set. Done. All right. Now you guys, you guys give me the rest if you can. Um, just type them in the chat. What other things would you expect a set to be able to do? You want to be able to add a, add a number to a set. This is assuming that it's just an integer set. Um, yep. Union and intersect. Yeah. So there's two like math for anyone who's kind of been doing 1081. It's like you can get two sets and you can combine them together and remove the duplicates, that's a union, or you can get two sets and only keep what's between them both, which is an intersection. Trent says, check how many elements are in the set. Um, Hamish says, unions as well. Dev says, set products, count the number of sets, able content contain itself, cardinality, confluent, lots of great things. Search a set, okay, really good. So here's some basic operations that we're gonna be going through, um, which are, we wanna be able to, we're calling it a collection but it's a set. Um, we want to be able to create an empty set. We want to be able to insert an item into the set. We want to be able to remove something from the set, find something, which I think Zach said, like search a set for a particular thing. We want to be able to check the size of it, which is cardinality of a set. Um, we want to be able to drop or delete that set. We want to be able to print it, and we want to be able to check if it unions or intersects with another set. Um, so these are like, when we talked about an abstract data type, we said it's a set of values and a collection of operations. So this is the collection of operations. But the set of values is actually um, essentially the, uh, like what would you say? Um, that's just like the numbers. Like a set is just a collection of numbers. So the set of values is just integers, right? Now, there's a lot of other great operations that people have mentioned in the chat. We're just going to keep it like simple for today. But it's really good seeing so many like good ideas. Um, so we said that when we're kind of trying to construct this set ADT that we want to think about its behavior first. So when we write a set ADT, the first thing we start off with when it comes to programming is not actually implementing the set, but it's, um, I'll make a new section for 2.2. It's actually going to be writing the, the abstract data type itself. So I'm just going to, um, Ah, that was the wrong thing to do. Um, I'm just going to like start writing one here. So when you start writing an ADT, um, pretty much the first thing you do is you create a .h file. So if I'm writing myself an abstract data type, um, I would create myself a .h file and I'll call it set.h home uh, 2521 2.2. I'll just call this one set.h. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're actually going to put some operations inside that set file, which I'm just going to copy and paste from here. Now I've written these in advance just so we can save some time. 
But <clears throat> the idea here is that we simply write down all the things that we think we can do with a set and we give it some really basic information like what's the return type, um, what are the parameters, and these kind of make sense, right? Like you could figure these out by yourself. It's like when we create a set, it's going to return a set. So we call set create, it gives us a new set. When we call set insert, um, we have to give it a set because like this function, this operation needs the set to actually insert something to, and then we give it what we're inserting. Set delete, the same thing. And both of those don't return anything because they're just operations on the set. We have set member, as in, is it a member of the set? Does it exist? Search for it, which returns us an int, which will probably be true or false. Um, and then we also have to give it the member we're searching for. We have set cardinality, which is how big is the set? What's the size of the set? Um, you know, you kind of get this. These are all the different operations. And then you have a union and intersection, which are going to return us new sets. Um, and then we destroy a set at the end, which is kind of like freeing it. Um, so this is kind. these are kind of our sets. Now, generally speaking here, this is actual valid C code. Will this even compile? I think, oh no, it won't, because set doesn't mean anything. But it's really simple C code. And this is a series of declarations that haven't actually been implemented or defined. Um, it's just an abstract data type. It's just defining the operations you can do on it. So um, that's how we start with the behavior. That's how we start with this, what behavior does this ADT need? We're building the interface right now. We're not worried. Is it a list? Is it an array? Is it a whatever? It doesn't matter, right? Uh, what do you mean it says at the bottom? Oh yeah, it's, I mean, I, 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 all, all C is backwards compatible with C++, so it doesn't really matter, but thank you, that could be confusing for people. Um, so, the only other part of a set ADT is the rest of the .h file, and there's a couple of key principles that we're going to chat about here, um, and this finishes off our, our set ADT file, and you'll pretty much do this for any kind of abstract data type you make. Um, typically, in a language like C, all data types you create are usually pointers to some um, sort of struct or something. Um, and you'd be familiar with this with like linked lists, right? Um, or if you've been using queues and other things, like I know a bunch of you are doing the labs already, so these concepts you're like, yeah, okay, I think I get this. Um, but most abstract data types are just a pointer to some kind of struct. And you can see it in this case. Um, pro tip is always reading things backwards. That's like a good tip I got taught, which is like always read from right to left. So it's like, you know, a set is a pointer to a struct set rep. Um, that's what the type def here is. So simply saying that a set is a pointer to a struct of this type. Um, and this is part of your ADT. C's a little bit weird because like you can't like fully abstract everything, um, but you can effectively abstract it. And we're actually going to put this on the top and the bottom of our set file. So I'm just going to slap my ADT functions here like this. So this is actually our complete um, ADT right here. I'm going to get rid of this comment, um, but it will typically follow this pattern. You have some funny things up the top and some funny things at the bottom. You then have any hash includes you need um, or you will always need. We probably don't need stud.io here. Um, and there is this other library called standard bool.h, which uh, is basically something that allows you to use true and false. So if you hash include standard bool.h, you can use true and false instead of hash defining them. So I can actually use like, you know, true here if I want to. I'll keep it with, as an int for now. Um, but generally speaking, it's like, you know, just that. Um, now, the only interesting part of this entire file that you haven't kind of seen before yeah, are these funny little things, if and def, if, if not defined, that's what this says. Um, and this says end if. So see, see like preprocessor commands here um, essentially what this is doing is preventing it being defined multiple times. Um, there's instances where you don't have to use this, though generally you'll actually see this in a lot of code. That's kind of why I want to talk about it here. Um, and what this does is this prevents multiple definitions um, in cases where many files kind of end up hash including the same file. It's not something you need to lose much sleep over. Because essentially what it's saying is that if there is a if there is a hash defined that's not defined, set h, let's define it, 
And then from this point on, if this file ever gets included as part of the compilation binary, um, it will skip over this because like it's like you define it once and then you never use it again. Um, effectively for the scale of the projects you work with in this course, you don't really need to stress about that um, because this, is, this isn't so much like when you have two files side by side that both include the same .h, it, I'm pretty sure it's more if you kind of have a file that includes a .h and then a file that includes another file that includes a .h. Um, so again, it's not like a hard thing that's going to change your life. It's more like you'll actually see this a lot in like C libraries if you deal more with C. Um, but it's very much a compilation thing. It tries to prevent multiple definition errors. Um, yeah, for this. So, yeah. Great. Um, so that's our, that's our ADT. Really simple. We have the data type here, set. Now you notice it's, it is an abstract type because I don't know what the hell a struct rep is, a set rep, set representation. I don't know, we haven't written it. So it's totally abstract to me. All I know is that the name of the data type I'm interacting with is called set. And these are the operations I have on it. We have no idea how it works. Is it implemented as a linked list, as a circular queue? Like, like who knows, it doesn't matter because we're interested in the behavior. So this is where that whole user thing comes in. So this is like, um, uh, this is what a user would see. So what typically happens in like a, maybe a software project here is that if you're a, a user of, AD, uh, of an ADT and someone else is building it, this is the first step. This is what happens before anyone uses it and before anyone builds it, right? Actually implements it is you, you kind of agree on this interface. You actually define the abstract type here. So now what would happen is someone would go away and actually write a program that uses this, just like you might use a, a QADT, and then someone else goes away and builds it. So that's kind of what, um, this is the finished file here. We've got set copy and other things. Um, I, I'm not going to go into this in much depth, but because um, you can read it. Um, but essentially, this is what where pre and post conditions can come into things as well, where it's like, okay, on our set create, um, <laughs> this this line here is the only part that needs to be removed because I originally had this taken an int, but I think I removed the int but left the comment there. So maybe look at one of this. It's like for set insert, the precondition is that a valid set is provided, and the post condition is that a new element n is now in the set. So it's kind of like saying to you know what are the conditions to be held true at the start and what are the conditions that are held true at the end. Um, so these are really useful notes for someone who's trying to use your ADT or even implement it because it, it, it explicitly um, defines the behavior. Uh, can there be no preconditions? I guess so, yeah. I mean, like set create has no preconditions. I mean, th there's no hard and fast rule on this stuff either because some people might be like, oh, well, to create a set, I need to malloc. So like a precondition is that like the mem the computer has enough memory and stuff. And it's like, yeah, but uh, like you can take this as far as you want. There's a, it's a very human thing pre and post conditions. Um, Jay says also a post condition could be that there's no duplicates if it's already there. Uh, yeah, that's another great post condition. That's what I mean. Like you could include that. You could not like, no one's going to like kill you if you do don't um, because we're not assessing this to some crazy degree and there's also no perfect way to do it. So, you know, take it as far as you want. Now, when we use this set, this is how the actual compilation works. We write a main file that uses the set and we compile it with the .h file. So this is my, my set.c. This is me actually using the set. I hash include the set.h and then I compile it into my set.o and then someone else over there who actually implements the set create set.c, which actually has the implementation of how it works and it actually implements those functions. And that compiles into a set.o. And then we link those two together. That's what GCC does for us into my, my set, like an executable. So this is that whole point, the separation of a user and an implementer is the implementer actually goes and makes those functions, gives definitions to all those functions. And someone goes and uses them and then we compile them all together at the end. And the cool part about this is it allows us for the same set implementation 
to have many different C programmers use it for different instances. And it also means that you as a C programmer can use different set implementations as long as they work on the same ADT definitions, as long as they work on the same .h file. Um, so very powerful abstraction. Now this is an example of a set usage. I've got this file here called testset1.c and I'm just going to paste this here. I'll call it testset1.c. Um, and you can see that it includes set.h and then it's just a main function that creates a new set. Um, it scanf instead <laughs> could use scanf, um, though in this case we're just using a for loop to enter 26 numbers because like it's quick. All the every, 13 numbers because we're incrementing by two. So we we uh, do all that and then we show the set at the end. Now here's here's a really interesting example of how the compilation works. If I try and compile this, right? to test set. What happens is that um, uh, implicit declaration of function set show. Yeah, so, oh, am I using different language here? Oh no, sorry, I should have copied in the entire .h file. Um, I need these bottom two as well. Sorry, that's my bad. And we do need .io.h as well. Yes, thank you, new, new slides. Thanks for always catching on it. Um, so yep, yeah, and then we, uh, we need to hash include .io.h as well. And generally speaking, you include your um, libraries before your, your own files. Um, Jay says, if you try and compile multiple C files with multiple main functions, it will fail to link because it will see a redefinition of main. Um, it will just fail to do the linking at the end. So I run this again and it says implicit declaration of set show, show set, oh my god, bam, okay. So here's the interesting thing. The first two times I tried to do it, these are what you call compile errors. The program failed to compile to a binary. This one here, it succeeded compiling the file, but it failed to link it. Because when C programs to compile, they compile one file at a time and they don't actually need the definitions of functions when they compile it. They just need the declarations. They just need to know what its prototype is. So seeing set show here is enough to compile this file. Because the way the compiler works is it's like, okay, yep, this file makes sense. I can compile it. Let's hope the definition is somewhere when we link it. And then when it links it to another file, it's like, oh, there it is. Yeah, everything fits together nicely. But here, it's compiled it, and then it says undefined reference to set insert, undefined reference to set show. It can't find those functions when it's trying to link it. Now, we said before back in week one that instead of compiling to an executable, you can actually just compile from a C file to a .o file, which is like a midway. And you'll actually see this compiles successfully Fully. This actually compiles. It just doesn't link. And I hope that makes sense. I know it's probably like last week's probably gone from your brain already, but this has so sex successfully compiled into a binary file. Here it is here. Um, it just hasn't been linked into an executable yet. And that linking is because there is no definition of these libraries. So we need to actually define those libraries. We need to build our set so someone can actually use it for us. Um, and this is where we're gonna implement it. So there are three ways that we could implement this set. The first way um, is using an unsorted array. The second way is using a sorted array and the third way is using a linked list. So we're gonna start off with the sort unsorted array because it's nice and simple. Now the way we're gonna do this is pretty simple. Um, we're gonna have our struct set rep is just going to be defined as an integer array with a number of elements in it um, and then we're going to keep track of the size of the array and then we'll implement these functions right and we could do this pretty quickly so i'm actually going to copy this here hopefully it copies for me why doesn't that want to copy that's really mean it's probably something to do with the the image that's okay so remember how I said before, we had this nice slide here, which was like how they all link together. So we've done the set.h, we've done the my set, the user of the set. Um, but what we still have to do is actually like create the set library itself. 
So I'm going to make a new file here called set.c. Set.c. And what this file is going to do is it's going to include set.h as well because it's our ADT, it's our standard definition, it's our Bible for how things work. Um, and then I'll have to define max LMs as well. This is the maximum size of the set. So this is the struct set rep here. And the way this actually uh, works is that when my set test set one dot C compiles, it gets this type def, which says that a set, a set is a pointer to a struct set rep. And it says, hopefully when I link together at the end, someone will tell me what this is. And that's what we're doing in this file here. We're actually telling it, this is the concrete representation now of my set rep. Um, or Tomnal says, are we allowed to have our own libraries that we use in different assignments or does that break the weird self plagiarism rule? Uh, I think that's okay for this course at least. Um, and now we've got all of our little, like, little definitions here. So I'm going to comment all of these out and let's just start implementing them one at a time. So firstly, our, whoops, let's implement our set create because when we don't implement this and we try and compile this all together, right? I'll do this again. We compile our test set one dot C and our set dot C. So these two files compile separately and then link together at the end. It still compiles. Both of those files compile, but they fail to link again because nothing is actually um, made. So let's do set create to start. Um, and all the finished code for this is actually sitting like in the uh, in the exercises folder here. You can actually see like set array dot C. Um, it's all here, and I think for the sake of time, I might even just like copy and paste this. Um, so like set create here follows a fairly straightforward pattern, which is that we we create a new set a new pointer to a set. This isn't like the data for a set. This is just a pointer to it because um, that's what set is, right? It's a pointer to a struct. So this is kind of like saying, you know, int star a, it's just a pointer that hasn't been pointing to, hasn't pointed to anything yet. Um, so I create my set. And then what I try and do is I try to malloc enough memory for that set. Now I've been told um, that, uh, I've been told that you didn't do malloc checking in 1511, at least in T1. But generally speaking, something you'll see in this course is that malloc can actually fail. Malloc can actually fail. Um, and that's what this is checking here. So if, if, um, if malloc returns you null, then it, it's basically because the computer ran out of memory. And that's all we're really doing here. So this, this whole like little if statement here could really just be simplified if you were being really loose to just like, it could just be like this like really simple, right? Just like a simple malloc line. Um, you malloc, this is how much memory you need and the memory you need is the size of the struct, which is gonna be one int and then 10,000 ints as an array. So it's 10,001 ints. That's what this size of struct will give you. So malloc will allocate here 10,001 four byte integers or you know 40,004 bytes. That's what it will do. Um, but in this piece of code, it's just a little bit more developed because we're double checking that there's actually enough memory. Um, if you don't do this, I, nothing terrible will happen, but it's a good practice to get into. Um, is there anything wrong with an assert? Oh, that's an excellent question. So yes, there is. And the reason is because an assert is trying to ensure that you as a developer have written your code correctly. Whereas what's happening here is we're actually trying to communicate something to a user. So asserts are for developers, because you write tests for developers, you don't write tests for users. So here what we're really saying is like, oh, this program actually works, but there are some weird circumstances in which it will fail for one of our users. And one of those circumstances is that there's not enough memory. Just like, you know, if there's a file error or something. So we create the set. We don't need to initialize the array because arrays are kind of ready to go, but we do need to set the size of the array zero, right? So we set that as zero and we return a pointer to that set. We've malloc the set, we return a pointer to it. So we've done that function here. Now watch what happens when I compile. We previously had three undefined reference. Oh God, we haven't included some things. Ah. So I think what we're missing here is standard lib.h because that's where malloc is. So malloc's in standard lib.h. And fprintf, I think, is hiding inside of studio.h from memory. So, yep. 
and now we have an error because um, so okay so here's another example um, of like what's happening here is that we're trying to define set create with an int um, but it's now essentially saying that hey 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 I saw set create here and it did not take in an int thank you very much um, it just like so please don't do that so I got to get rid of that int there because we're not actually using that um, someone asked a question what's fprintf um, it's like printf, but it allows you to print to a file. But in this case, the file is the standard error output stream. So it's essentially just saying print to standard error. Um, this is again one of those things that you'll just see in the course, and like you don't have to go into it much depth with. Um, so yeah, this is just saying print to standard error instead of standard out. Because you could just do a printf, like you, you could just do that. But without getting into the whole Unix file system thing, that's not ideal. Um, so, you know, no one's going to kill you if you wrote a lab this week that does like that. That's totally fine. Um, <clears throat> is set a keyword? No, set's not a keyword. We define it here. We define set as a type def, as a pointer to a, um, a struct, whatever. Um, Waleed well, says, didn't you already include .ao.h and set.h, or do you have to go do that again? Um, if I did include it here, you don't have to do it again, though as I've gotten older, I've started to understand that best practice is you should always try and include the libraries in the file you use it in. Like you should always try and include, like if you use it here, you should always include it even if it's in the .h file, because maybe the .h file uses it for a different reason, and then down the line it gets removed from it, um, and that's also actually why we have these um, if and def stuffs because this is actually what prevents multiple definition. So like if your .h file and your .c file include studio.h, studio.h internally prevents multiple definitions. That's kind of what this is for. Um, Autumnal says, should you do the if and def with standard libraries? Well, it's actually done in the standard library for you because you didn't write those .h files. That's, that's like why they're there. Um, uh, and then Jay also says, uh, in my variable names for the int in my function arguments, don't, doesn't it need a name? Um, C has a language rule which says that when you're declaring a function, just declaring as in you're not actually using the braces and telling it what it does, but you're just um, putting the semicolon there, you don't actually need to give it variable names. So I could do this, though you don't need to do that. Because as all the compiler needs when it actually builds your code is it just needs to know the type. It doesn't care about what it's called here. It only cares about what it's called when it's actually defining the function because it needs to like make it work. So I got distracted there. Um, you notice here that when we ran this again, we went from having three undefined errors to two because we defined set create. So now let's define set insert and set show as well. So set insert should be pretty simple. Um, I mean, here we could even just think about it without looking at the thing. It's like, oh, well, um, I would just say that my, I have to give it a name like set s and int item. Uh, I could just say, uh, yep, uh, s alems, because remember s is a pointer, so it's the dash arrow um, of s and, ale and, and alems. Huh, that's a funny name. Equals item s and lms plus plus. I'm sure it's something like that. I'm sure the, the sample code actually does some checking if it's too big. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't even check. Yeah, I didn't even check for duplicates because I'm an idiot. Um, isn't it a problem that sets? Yeah, so devs, devs one step ahead here and that's why the actual code itself is more, more complicated um, is that and I'll go fix up some of this code again. I'm, I'm sorry that some of these things aren't perfect right off the bat, even though I think this one seems, this one is normally n here, but I like to call this one item because I think it's a bit easier. So we create a variable called i. This is old school C. We can put it inside the for loop here. Um, we for loop for the size of the array. And as we go through it all, we try and check if it already exists. So this is essentially a check if it's already in their loop. And if it is in there, we return immediately without doing anything. Um, and then we actually add the element. So this is what I just wrote. I didn't do the duplicate checking. Um, so now we run it again. Um, again, I know, I know autumnal asks, is there a reason we had int i here? I'm pretty sure older versions of GCC did not allow you to declare a variable in the, the first part of the for loop. 
Um, so I think this code has just been like largely handed down for years. I've just gone and changed all the names and stuff, which is why there's the odd little typo, even though the logic is fundamentally the same. You could get an array out of bounds error. That's something else we could also check and we should also check here that um, the there's enough space to actually put it there. Um, though I couldn't be bothered right now and I don't want to waste time on it. So now we're nearly there. This code is compiled that the last thing is when it's failed to link, um, it can't find the set show, which is the last function we want to copy here. So I'm going to get set show. And we're going to print the set. That's all it does. So I hope there's a set show here. Yeah, there was great. So now with set show, uh, we're just going to printf and open brace. And then we're going to do a little for loop here again. Um, and we're just going to go through each of the items and then we're just going to print them out. And at the end, um, we check is i less than um, the number of elements minus one and not at the end each loop. So th what this is basically doing is doing a comma after every single print except for the last one. That's all it's really doing here. So you could easily just like keep that. Like I might just remove this to like for now just to like make it even really simpler what it's doing. So it's just like literally print, print and then loop over everything and print it out. So now when I compile this and I run it, test set, we have a set. 13579, right? That's what our test set was doing. It was creating a set. It was iterating over it. It was iterating over 1 to 26, two at a time. It was adding to that set and then we printed the set at the end. So nice and simple. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, so nice and simple. It iterated over at the end and then we showed the set. Done. Um, and you could go and implement all these other things and they're all in this file here. Like you can find it on WebCMS3. Here's the union of two sets, the intersection of two sets, the cardinality. Um, and most of these functions are not super complicated. There's the member of a set. Um, this one's pretty easy. You could have actually used the member of a set inside of our set insert rather than duplicating code. That would have been good code design. Um, because now we, we've kind of got repetition here, which isn't good. So we could have like reused our set member function um, inside our own code here, or we could have used a helper function. Um, you can actually see we're doing this inside of set copy as we're actually using one of our own functions here, uh, which is really helpful. And then we have set destroy at the end, which actually just frees it, um, which is pretty easy as well. So that's, that's kind of it. Um, like, I mean, that's not it. We're going to talk about another couple of implementations. I don't think we'll need the full time, which is good. I don't want to say that too early, but um, essentially the point here is we have a user of the set which uses the ADT but doesn't know how it's built. And then we have the implementation of the set that knows how it's built but doesn't know how it's used. And then we have a set.h in the middle, which is the glue, the definition, the interface that helps everyone understand what's happening. It defines the conditions, it defines the operations, um, makes it all clear. Generally, this is where most of the comments are. And a lot of what we're going to be doing in this course is stuff like that. Sometimes we'll give you an ADT and we'll say implement it. Sometimes we'll give you an ADT and say, um, use it. You don't need to know how this works. Like, and you see students struggle with this sometimes in the early days as you're like, oh, here's a set insert. And they're like, well, how do I use it? I don't know how it works. And it's like, well, again, how do I use it? I don't know how it's built. It's like, well, you know how it works. You add a number in and it adds a number. Done. You know how it behaves, I should say. That's, prob that's probably the best, like, that's why I like the word behavior because you're, you're focused on the behavior of something, um, which is, I think is very clear. But um, let, us, let us keep moving on because we've done our unsorted array thing um, and, you know, we've done some code here, but let's have a look at the time complexity. So, our unsorted array has an insert time and a deletion time and a lookup time of on. Now this makes sense because it's an array, right? We've done this already today. You, you just have to tick through all the elements in the array, like tick, 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 tick. So the worst case is having to insert it at the end. Well, I mean, you always have to insert it at the end. You have to go through all the elements and then add it at the end. When you delete it, worst case is you have to go through all the elements. When you try and check if a number exists in there, you have to maybe, worst case, go through all the elements to see if it's there. 
So for n element set, it's worst case O n. Um, for union or intersection, um, it's O times n. Uh, the reason for this, and it's very obvious once you start to understand these time complexities, because if you go down here and you have a look at the union um, method, you might look at this and think, oh, I see why it's O n. It's because there's two four n squared, o, uh, n times n. You're like, that's because it's two for loops. But that's actually not the case. It's because when you do a union of two sets, right? And I'll just, for those of you who like, um, have forgotten it, the union of two sets is like um, combining them together. So like the union of these three sets is getting all the numbers between them, right? So, and to do that with code, you essentially have to loop through set A, add them to a new set, and then loop through set B and add them to a new set. So the actual inserting of the set is ON already. Like we kind of know that, right? Because inserting to a set is like ON because you have to loop through the array. So what you've actually got happening here is you have to loop through array one and then insert each element which itself is O n. So basically it ends up being n times m, where n and m are the sizes of the respective arrays, uh, sets, sorry. Um, well, array is the same thing. So that's why it's O times n times n. Now, essentially this is like n squared if the two sets were the same size, but in this case it's n times n because the sets might have a different size. And then you can see that the storage space needed is the maximum number of elements in the set. So for a set to function, we had to do this um, struct definition where we said max LMs is 10,000. So the space complexity, the storage needed for this unsorted array is 10,000 always, um, which in this case is just represented by E, which you could argue is constant time, I guess, but like, you know, that's a bit stupid. So um, yeah, that's an unsorted array. Now, a sorted array uh, is a bit more interesting because we're going to use an array like before, except the main differences are that um, we want it to be sorted. Now, the benefit of it being sorted are that when we try and check if something's in it, we can binary search to look for it, which we know is really, really quick. When we want to insert something, we have to binary search to see if it's there already. Right, because remember when you insert into a set you have to check if it's there and if it's not there you add it, if it is there you don't do anything. So for an insertion we have to binary search it and then shift it up because with a sorted, like with a, with an unsorted array you can effectively just like, you can effectively just start inserting numbers like this and when someone wants a new number inserted you just add it to the end. Whereas with a sorted array, like if you already have this and someone says I want to insert a 4, you have to first like do a little binary search for the 4 and you say oh it's not there but then when you insert it you have to not only put it in here but you have to like move these two elements back right because an array is like contiguous memory. So anytime you like try and shove an element in the between two elements in an array you need to shift everything down um, and that takes time as well. And deletion is the exact same and opposite. Um, you know, so we have to binary search where we think it is, and if, if it's there and we delete it, we have to shift everything back down. So what this means is that for a sorted array, um, that kind of implementation, in terms of looking at the data structure and algorithm complexity, is going to be, under some circumstances, quicker and slower for insertion and deletion, but really quick for lookups. So similarly, if you know that your set doesn't have elements in it, um, sorry, if you know your set doesn't change much, but you're looking it up all the time, you're constantly checking if things are in there, then a sorted array implementation is a great idea because lookup is so quick. Um, and if we look at the implementation, oh, let me look at the implementation of this in our um, code file. So we have array sorted. Let's just look at the three kind of key functions, which are set, insert, Has someone, has someone, am I, someone bamboozling me? I don't think this looks like a binary. Oh, hmm. That's not good. God damn it, Hayden and John. I might have uploaded the wrong one. That's okay. Um, interesting. 
So the implementation of this just requires the modification of like search and um, search and insert and delete, right? Um, so for insert, what we would have to do, just like, and let's write it out with pseudo code first, right? As you would essentially say, well, you know, step one is I have to check if it's in there um, with the binary search. Now you could reuse the code we wrote in the other lecture to binary search. You know, you don't have like, I would just copy and paste that in right now. And then step two is if it is in there, we have to insert and shift. Now I know that I know that Wally just kind of joked about me not opening Excel, but we're about to open Excel because I, I like how Excel has little grids, which is really helpful. Because um, if you have an array, right, like the general idea of shifting is that if you have an array that's like this, um, where you have these elements, uh, in an unsorted array, if someone says, I want to insert a six, you just like loop through it and then you add a six at the end. But in a sorted array, you kind of loop through it and then you figure out where to put it, which is right here, but the problem is seven's already there. So then you need to go and like move nine to there and eight to there and seven to there, and then you move six up. Um, sorry, I probably said the wrong thing. If it's not in there, we want to insert it. I probably just said my words backwards. So then if you want to insert a three, it's the same thing. You have to like go through and go through and you're like, oh, this is where a three should be. So then you have to go and like shift all these across. And you just kind of do this with some for loops and um, like that. So you kind of just shift everything across to leave space and then you put your new thing in there. And that's essentially what inserting and deleting is like. I, I don't have the time to, I mean, generally I'm writing a lot of code in the lectures compared to normal. So like, I don't want to apologize for not writing more code because like I write a lot, but um, you know, we can't do everything and I'll, I'll update the code with the right stuff for this. Um, but yeah, the point is if you want to delete the four, well, then you delete the four and then you move everything back one. So similarly, it's like this is what we call shifting down. So for a sorted array, we not only have to find it, but we have to shift it. Um, and for an unsorted array, we have to just, you know, add it to the end. Um, and as we know, lookups really quick on this, because if you want to check the number three, well, what do you do? You binary search it. You start with five. Five's too big. So you halve this one. You go to two. Two's too small. We go to three. That was only three steps as opposed to like eight. So binary searching is really quick, right? Um, and what this leaves us with is if we just take our normal unsorted array and we turn it into a sorted array, then suddenly our implementation times change as well. Our storage space is still OE because it's an array. So we have this like 10,000 size max. Our union and intersection time is still the same because it's essentially the um, the product of looping through because there's no there's no binary search for union and intersection you have to loop through everything um, and then an insert our member time is log n but our insert time and our delete time is still o n which is kind of strange right because we know that if you were to look at it to do like a binary search insert we'd first have to do a binary search to find what we want to insert to see if it's there and then after that, we would have to um, we would have to do like a an n size thing, right? Because you actually have to shift all the elements. So shifting the elements is like you know one, two, three, four, five, six, like that, um, and that takes time. But what do we know about big O notation? Is you only include the highest order. So we know that n is bigger than log n. So O of log n plus n ends up being O of n. So the point is that as this program scales, even though the insert and delete for a, a sorted array set is physically longer, even though it physically takes a little bit longer, the binary search is just dumb. And we saw this before, right? Like if you have like a hundred thousand elements, what's the log? What's the log of a hundred thousand? It's like, I don't know, it's like 15, 16, something. Um, What's like, what's, what's a hundred thousand? Well, it's a hundred thousand. So that like log n component is like tiny, right? It's like 16, it becomes irrelevant. So log n plus n becomes O n. So even though again, this is literally slower, slightly, arguably, it, that gets a bit complicated, but generally like if you assume it's a little bit slower, it's still O n. And yes, this is a times n. Yes should be that should be a times n um, 
and I'll fix that up too. Thank you for that little typo as there. Um, there are some there are some fancy ways you can speed this stuff up, which we're not kind of going to get into. Um, and then the last thing we're talking about today is uh, link list implementations. And again, we do have the code for this. It's here as set list. So like, I don't need to take you through it all because like we've talked about linked lists already and you can go through this in your own time. Otherwise we'd have to spend a whole hour of the lecture going through all the detail. But essentially you could also implement this as a set implementation where your set pointer just points to the head of a list or to a struct, which contains the number of elements and are pointed to the head of the list, I should say. So your set points to a struct, like here. Your struct points to the first node, and then you keep track of the size. So that's what you'd be doing here. Um, and that's the, like the set implementation. And we could, like I could show you, this is how cool ADTs are. We could take some of the definitions. So we could take our set create here. We're gonna copy that in and override our set create here. We could take our set insert, which is essentially just all linked list logic stuff. So, you know, like we have a current node and then we loop over it. This is us checking if it exists. This is us creating a new node. This is us setting up the new node and, and so forth. Um, and then the last one we have a set show, which is an iterative, you could do this recursively too, which is just an iterative printf where you loop through the linked list, right? So it's quite a straightforward loopy loo through the linked list. Um, and we would have to update our struct as well because we're not using an array anymore. We're using a, uh, you know, just a pointer. And I also need to include this stuff too. Um, here, where, um, you know, this is our nodes. This is our like standard LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn. This is our standard link list structure. Um, and then this is our actual set rep that is defined in the .h file. So now we've totally ripped apart the guts of this and we're using a different build of the same ADT. And if we try and uh, compile it, it's gonna um, probably fail on me. Oop, something's wrong. Err, because I called it item, very silly. Um, and then I go to compile this and then I run it and it does the exact same thing. Uh, it's printing it out and uh, yeah, well this one is... Why is it printing it out so... Oh, it's reverse. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, I wonder why that's doing it. Oh yeah, of course. Duh. So it's just how the insert's working. So the insert's just inserting in a different order. The order doesn't matter because even though it, like even though our actual underlying data structure is ordered in this case, the set itself has no sense of order. So it doesn't really matter how it how it uh, prints out here. But this linked li linked list is different. So you might ask yourself the question: Why would I ever want to do that? I like arrays. Arrays give me less headaches. Arrays don't seg fault as much. Why would I ever code a linked list? And the reason all comes down to time complexity, right? So when you look at the time complexity of an unsorted linked list, um, well, I mean, it's, this one isn't so much time complexity. This one's probably a little more space complexity. Um, in, in a lot of instances, linked lists have really fast insert and deletes, which we're gonna talk about next week when we talk about trees. So the, the benefit of pointer structures is that they're often really slow to look through and really quick to modify. And arrays are often very slow to modify and very quick to look through. That's not so much the case here because the inserting, it's kind of funny because the inserting into a linked list is instant, right? Because you just insert it at the end or the head depending on your structure um, and how you keep track of it. Well, it can be instant, but you still actually have to check every element to see if it's in there. So just like an array, you do have to go through every element um, to check if it's in there. And that's why it's ON as well. Member lookups ON because you have to check every element to see if it's there. Um, the union intersection is the same as the others because union inter intersection is often just literally the insert time of both sets. But you will notice that the storage space is a lot less. Instead of being OE, um, it's going to be uh, ON, where N is the number of nodes. Because we don't have to create this big screw off array 
And someone asked in the chat, could we just like do a, a reallocation for the array? You could, but then that would like that would slow it down finitely. It wouldn't change the big O. It would make the big O time better, but um, you could. I mean, you could take all these things in a hundred directions, right? Like there, this is not like a gospel. This is just like a particular set of implementations. Um, Hamish says, wouldn't intersection time for a sorted array be O times log M? Uh, intersection time. Could be, yep, if you implemented it like that. Like, there's no such thing as like, what is, this, what is the sorted array intersection time? Because it depends on the algorithm. But yes, you could make a sorted array intersection time O um, of n log m. And if anyone's curious, you know, try and do that yourself. Like a big part of like a lot of what computer science and performance is, is literally just being like, okay, well, we have an n squared algorithm. How do we make it quicker? And someone said to me at the start of the course or something, is like what are like what are we doing with these algorithms um something that isn't huge in this course but i think i, I mentioned there's a great course that cse offers called programming challenges um don't, don't know the course code of it but um it's a great course i did it with a guy called ravine who was a casual at cse when i was an undergrad he actually just got hired full-time for cse like a week ago or something which is super exciting because he's a math guy and he's super smart um, but generally speaking, this course called Programming Challenges 4128, it's definitely not a wham booster. Uh, it's the soul crusher, which is a good feeling. Uh, pretty much everything you do in that course is like trying to reduce like n cubes to n squared log n and n squared to like n log n's and like um, n log n's to like n's and n's to log n's. Like often often there are some limitations with what you can literally do. Like you can't just figure out a way to make like an N squared program constant time. Like there's just like the laws of mathematics that prevent you from making everything instant, right? Um, but you can be smart, which we keep talking about in the course, to, to speed things up a little bit. Um, intro to astronomy I did as a WAM booster and it was a really crappy course I found, mainly because uh, mainly because it was like easy, but there was like a quiz in this due every week. So I kind of did it because I wanted an easy course. But in hindsight, what I was looking for was a course that didn't control my time, which I like, I failed, um, which I didn't like, you know what I mean? Like it was easy, but it was like, oh, you got to do this right now. You got to do this in three days and that in three days and that in four days. And like, that's not what I want in a course. I like courses with like big assignments and no labs and stuff that I could like control my time a bit more. But I mean, this was like five, six years ago. So just ignore me. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then um, oh, last thing really quick, this ADT summary slides are pretty self-explanatory. But um, Kevin, who's an incredible tutor, asked me to point uh, to, to explain that there's this error that happens sometimes um, which I just want to explain quickly what it means. And it's like, it's dereferencing pointer to an incomplete type. So you can actually tell if you're using an ADT correctly because um, some of you might be tempted sometimes to try and use structs directly um, in terms of like, you know, you have a set here, like nothing in C strictly prohibits you doing something like this. Nothing actually prohibits you saying like printf, um, percent D uh, S LMs or S N LMs. So this here is what I would call breaking abstraction, right? This is what I would call breaking abstraction where you are no longer using the ADT, but you are using part of the implementation. You are, you've gone into and under the abstraction and you're using it. And while this might compile, um, oh, it won't. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know why I said that. This is what this error means here. So if you ever get dereferencing pointed to incomplete type, it's essentially saying to you that as this file compiles, all this file knows when it compiles is what's in here and what's in the .h. And there is no concrete definition here because it's hiding in this file, which is a separate file. So dereferencing pointed to incomplete type usually means that you're essentially breaking abstraction. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, it's four o'clock now, which means we got to wrap up. Um, thank you to everyone for putting up with this fairly fast paced lecture. Um, I don't think the content's wildly hard because I know your labs this week have kind of got you in the mindset. Um, 
again like you kind of been like oh you know you've been doing the cues and stuff so i'm hoping that you're like feeling a bit more warmed up to some of these topics um let's get the qr code up thank you um this is lecture 2.2 on abstract data types um i the only real thing is that there's a couple of typos i'll fix up in the slides and also i'll actually put up the correct sorted array implementation um into the notes here so currently like pretty much everything we went through today is like well i'll just i'll just clean up some of this stuff here um inside the the code files but i'll do that tonight so um cool well thank you everyone i hope you have a great day um and i'll see you next week good luck with your labs and you'll hear from me probably tomorrow i'll send out another notice um and if you're worried about not getting it uh trust me you'll you'll figure out these topics there are topics in the cast that can be like these there are topics in the course that can be really hard to get your head around in the long term but these topics you always get there in the end so um yeah thank you have a good day everyone